So when I first started sitting um, at uh, IMS in Barry in the early 80s, it was mindfulness 24-7, you know, that, and I, I sort of, and of course when you learn something, you kind of think that's it, right? That's the whole thing, and that certainly I do. And I, uh, so the lineage was from Mahasi Sayadaw, and, and it, really wa it really was 24-7 uh, mindfulness, mindfulness, mindfulness. And so really, you, we heard very little about concentration back then, you know, and I began to think concentration was just like bad. You shouldn't concentrate too much, you should be mindful, you know, and so, you know, don't get stuck in these states, these high states of absor absorption. And um, it's not that anybody said that, they probably, nobody said that. It's probably just something I made up, more, I really and truly. But it is true that back in the 80s, as Vipassana came into America, you didn't really hear much about samadhi. It wasn't a big deal. It was mindful, sati, 24-7, sati, sati, sati. And as we practiced it, say in three-month retreats, I mean, it was lifting, 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 lifting. If you're going to pick your nose, picking, <laughs> lifting, lifting. You know, I mean, really, you go to the back. Whatever you do, it was relentless mindfulness. And not to say that, you know, you couldn't possibly do that without concentration, obviously. But it was mindfulness, mindfulness. And then um, somewhere around the early 90s, you started hearing, you know, like you said, there'd be a treat at, uh, say, Spirit Rock where they were doing the jhanas. Just started creeping in slowly in the 90s. Uh, concentration started coming in. And so then it became sort of uh, 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 rather okay to uh, focus on the, other aspect of um, it's called the two wings of meditation. I've heard, read that uh, analogy so many times: mindfulness and concentration. So anyway, <clears throat> but we don't talk so much about concentration. It's quite interesting to me. Now you go into uh, other lineages, uh, uh, Mahayana, and concentration would be a lot more. You find a lot more about it in Mahayana and Zen. Um, indeed, the word Zen comes from the word Chan, and the third Chan comes from the word Jhana, and the word Jhana comes from the word Jhana, which is meditation or the absorptions. So, I mean, did you get that? <laughs> it's, it's quite amazing. So, in other words, uh, the uh, we're going to talk about that word Jhana. So uh, then, as you, so I sort of found myself moving more and more off the reservation. It gets on Brian's nerves or Jeff's nerves, whatever your name is of this week. So I, I sort of moved off of the uh, Terravada res reservation a long time ago and sort of got more and more interested in the uh, other lineages. I never did dismiss the, uh, the Theravada, certainly, it's wonderful. So, um, and as that happened, I became more interested and more aware of the, what is meant by concentration. So, I wanted to share, first of all, with you all, this Seminole Sutra. This is like the big, this is one of the real biggies. Um, let's see if I can find it. Um, you've heard this you might not have heard all of it, or, well, I've dropped it in the bathtub, by the way, so it's, it's a little wrinkly. I do all my reading in the bathtub in hot water. It's true. In New York, people would say, if, if I was like having a good week, they would say, did you have a three bath day, Victor? <laughs> so yes, I did. I had a four bath day sometimes. Okay, so um, this is really extraordinary. So I'm, I want to read this to you because this is going to be a, the real, in a way, the real introduction to what the Buddha meant by the, by the absorption, the concentration. Um, you know that I, I wrote last week in the Dharma Corner that I think that we should be shot for calling samadhi concentration. Uh, so uh, is concentration is an English word that so does not describe what 
the Buddha taught as samadhi. This, the eighth step of the, eight, of the Eightfold Path is samadhi. We call it concentration, and um, we get a little, but it just doesn't work. So we're going to say, we're going to call this samadhi, if you don't mind. So, uh, you know that the Buddha uh, went through six years of extreme uh, ascetic practices, and um, I thought I'd read a little bit of this, and so, so um, um, he would hold his breath. And see, there's a yoga thing of uh, stopping your ears, your ears. He would hold his breath and until, you know, his whole body was on fire. And uh, he did all of these ascetic practices and, and really almost uh, killed himself. So at one point he decided, and so he was trying to, uh, he was trying to um, obliterate the sense of self, let's say it that way. He, had, he knew that, that the, the problem that we have is this little me that seems to be able to cling forever. So he went through these astonishing practices to wipe out me, right? I mean, it's not a good idea, but so, um, so I'll just give you a taste of this. It's wonderful. Suppose with my teeth clenched and my tongue pressed against the roof of my mouth, I beat down, constrained, crushed the mind with the mind. That's one thing he did. Then he started holding it. That didn't work. So, I mean, it just made him miserable. So then, then he started um, <coughs> holding his breath through different practices, extraordinary practices. Uh, suppose I practice the breathingless meditation. I stopped the in-breath, the out-breath through my mouth, nose, and ears. While I did so, there was a violent burning in the body, just as two strong men were to seize a weaker man by both arms and roast him over a pit of whole coals. So too, while I stopped the in-breath and out-breath, through my mouth, nose, and ears, there was a violent burning in my body. But although tireless energy was aroused in me and unremitting mindfulness, what we were kind of working on, kids, was established in my body, and my body was overwrought with, uh, and, uh, uh, but my body was overwrought and calm because I was exhausted. So he discovered, you know, that it was kind of good, okay, in his mind, but he was destroying his body. So that's four. There, I mean, I'm, I'm only reading one, but he did four of those extraordinarily breathing problem, uh, practices. So eventually he decided, well, I might as well just starve myself. <laughs> this is not working, right? I'm just not really, I'm not getting rid of me, so I'll just starve me to death, right? So he, did, he tried to do that. But the deities came down and said, you know, if you try to do that, we'll just feed you through the pores of your skin. They didn't want him to die. So he said, oh, well... So he decided, okay, he wouldn't starve himself. He would just eat a little bit. So he said, uh, <clears throat> so it, he was not going to entirely cut off food. He said, so I su suppose I take a little food. I don't think the Buddha talked like that, right? Really. He probably didn't have a southern accent. Do you think? <laughs> From Tennessee? Do you think? Maybe not. Maybe he did. Suppose I take very little food, a handful of each time, whether a bean soup, lentil soup, or a, a pea soup. So here's what he describes. Because of eating so little, my backside became like a camel's hoof. Not attractive. <laughs> because of eating so little, the projections on my spine stood forth like corded beads. Because of eating so little, my ribs jutted out, as gaunt as the crazy rafters of an old roofless barn. What wonderful literature. Because of eating so little, the gleam in my eyes sank far down in their sockets, looking like the gleam of water that had sunk far down into a deep well. Because of eating so little, my scalp shriveled and withered as a, as a green uh, bitter gourd shrivels and withers in the wind and sun. Because of eating so little, my belly skin adhered to my backbone. Thus, if I touched my belly skin, I encountered my backbone. Doesn't happen when I touch my belly. If he touched his backbone, he could feel the front. That's a person who's near death. People saw me and they, they you know, they thought his, his skin had turned black. So, um, this is a moment when he's really, really quite near death. And, um, at some point, 
he said, I can, he said, let's see if I can find this. He said, so by this practice of austerities, I have not attained any superhuman state. My distinction in knowledge and vision is not worthy of noble ones. Could there be another path to enlightenment? This is what he said after six years of doing that. Could there be some other way? And then he said, I considered, I recall that when my father, the Sakyan, was uh, occupied while I was sitting in the cool shade of a rose apple tree, quite secluded from sensual pleasures, this is, he was a little boy, quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states, I entered upon and abided in the first jhana. Or let's just say I entered into, this is this little boy, right? I entered into the first samadhi. which is accompanied by applied and sustained thought. Applied and sustained thought, vitaka and vichara. Uh, there are many different uh, suggestions as to what that means, but it certainly does mean the capacity to have a thought and to sustain it. And he said, he, and he had experienced rapture and pleasure of, born of seclusion. Then he asked the question, could that be the path to enlightenment? Then following on that memory came the realization that is indeed the path to enlightenment. So he remembered as a little boy that he experienced the first samadhi. And from that, he says that is, oh, he, he opened, his mind opened that this is the actual path to enlightenment. So this is really, I've shared this with you because this is really sort of like one of the core basic uh, uh, descriptions of what the Buddha considered to be concentration or samadhi. So then, then he so then he sits under the Bodhi tree, and this is the beginning of his. Uh, process of becoming in line. When I had eaten solid food, so he had something to eat. <laughs> he had a bite to eat to give him a little energy. So after he's had some food, he says, I had eaten solid food and regained my strength, and then quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states, I entered upon and embodied in the first samadhi, which is accompanied by applied and sustained thought with rapture, pleasure, born of seclusion. Okay, so he continued to sit, and uh, he experienced, of course, the, the thought or the, the awareness that the sustained thought, applied thought, and sustained thought can also can can pull you out. Well, no, let me go back and take this. The the key to the fact that he's has, that you've entered the first samadhi, the first jhana, is that the five hindrances are at bay, are no longer invading your mind. So we've talked about the five hindrances a lot of times, right? So what are the five hindrances? The attachment to greed. We're, we're losing we're losing our audience very fast. See by. Um, so you've heard this before, but it's, so, so let's just go over them again. The five hindrances are uh, greed, aversion, restless mind, sloth and torpor, and doubt. So the, the absence of those five hindrances is, this, is, is the entrance into the first job, right? It's a very big deal. Imagine that you're sitting and you do not have any of the five hindrances, right? You're sitting, you don't have greed. And that's actually what, is, what he means when he says, right, secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states. The unwholesome states of those five hindrances. So you can be sitting here, we can be sitting for 45 minutes. Uh, Marta might have had a moment of the five hindrances at bay when you came. Really? 
quite possible. Maybe you did, maybe you didn't. I'm looking at your face. Okay, so in other words, we can be sitting here and, and uh, the five hindrances can be temporarily at bay. I mean, isn't it true that haven't you had moments when you're sitting and you're going to like this very kind of wonderful place where there's nothing really attacking you in terms of desire, greed, right, greed, hatred, right? Yeah? Okay. Uh, you, you don't have to, you don't have to not. So that's not necessarily the first jaunt, right? That's just simply a momentary experience of, you might say, the neighborhood of it. You're near it, and it's actually called neighborhood concentration. But if you re-enter a place and you're sit where that you have stabilized that, and so you really are just stabilized in this uh, absence of the five hindrances, you're in that first jhana. So, what can get you out of the first jhana? Thinking. Applied thought, right? Just, I mean, in, in other words, the applied and sustained thought is, is there in the first jhana, but that certainly can pull you right back out of it just in a nanosecond. And so, so the Buddha would say, right, that the that the, the, the skillful meditator realizes that those two things can be um, left behind. If you have the capacity to stay sustained in this state of absorption, let's call it that, absorption, or this, the first samadhi, if you stay sustained in that, uh, the, the, the thinking, the applied and the sustained thought will disappear. And you have entered the second. That's called, you know what that's called? It's called noble sound. That's actually noble sound. We talk about noble silence on you know, an all-day retreat, and, uh, and, and, and then we'll say, well, you're practicing noble silence by not talking. It's not, it's not really noble silence. We say that, right, because it's good, right? I mean, because we, wanna, we want to, it's almost like an imitation of noble silence, right? I mean, not talking is like an imitation of it. But the real noble silence is that ain't talking. It's not talking. Well, this is Victor now sitting here, and he's doing quite well, right? Or Victor is now standing up. And walk. That's not noble silence, right? Even if I, you know, if all of us sitting here and our, our mouths are closed, that's not noble silence because something is really going wild. Someone uh, wrote to me uh, about, she was at the Forest Refuge when I was there in December, and she said when she walked into the hall, the hall there is Extraordinary. It's just so beautiful. You walk in, <laughs> and it's just, there's a marvelous feeling of silence, right? She said she, she walked in. I just got this email this morning. She said she walked in, and she said the hall was so quiet, she said she heard her mind screaming. <laughs> <laughs> and more than likely, she would never have heard her mind screaming, right? Except that it was just so quiet in there that suddenly she just realized, oh my God, you know. I, I once read that one person described it as being locked in a phone booth with a zoo. It's pretty good, isn't it? Isn't that a fit? <laughs> you like that, Brad? I mean, that, <laughs> that's pretty. So, so in the second jhana, second um, absorption, second samadhi, you've actually kind of stepped out of the, zoo, of the phone booth. So you're in... And so, so that has disappeared, and you're left with rapture and piti. Rapture is a, uh, piti is sort of a physical happiness, pleasure, and then rapture is, is more a, a, a mental ecstasy. So those two are, those are another sign that you're in a samadhi, by the way. <laughs> Feeling rapture, some some level of rapture. So then you're sitting there, the skillful meditator, the Buddha, is sitting there and saying, "Well, that rapture might be a little bit of a problem. <laughs> I might get a little attached to feeling rapture." So if you're, if the sit is that stable and that solid, and there's no longer thinking, no longer sustained thought, no longer applied thought, there's only rapture and pleasure and equanimity coming. Then, if you let go of rapture, you move, you're into the third jhana, the third samadhi. And then, if you let go of pleasure or pain, you slip into the fourth samadhi. This is what he says happened to him. Okay, so he entered in the fourth jhana, 
which is uh, basically what's left is equanimity and mindfulness in the fourth jhana. So, um, this is, in some ways, the, the uh, uh, evolution or, uh, or the development of the practice. Practice, as you see, it's like a steady letting go, clinging, right? Clinging first to, to sustain thought. We sit here and then we're thinking, and does it seem like we're clinging to it? No, I don't think so, but we are, obviously. Or why, does, why wouldn't it not just kind of fade away? So we're clinging to that and then we let that go and then we're, then we're clinging to maybe that wonderful feeling that you get in a deep trance. You let that go. So it's a letting go of clinging, letting go of clinging. So uh, at the fourth uh, level, the fourth jhana, uh, what, what remains, is he said, is uh, equanimity and mindfulness. Hello. By the way, this is, a, a, this is, this is not a meditation group. Oscar <laughs> no, this is we're actually at the party for the uh, Oscars. Good, I'm in the right place. <laughs> so, uh, so now it gets very interesting. So, I want to talk to you all about two different things in the sutras, in the scriptures. It's very, very um, interesting what happens. The Buddha describes enlightenment, and in, you know, and this is like. Um, Rather, rather inexplicable. I, I, but, but, but as you all have, uh, I think that I described this in our dependent origination course. I think I did. I don't remember. But, but the the Buddha describes his process of at the time at, when he reached the fourth jhana, which is neither pleasure nor pain. I like that. Right. That would be equanimity, wouldn't it? Right. The state of equanimity, neither pleasure nor pain. In other words, you're not attached to it. You know, the pleasure and pain is not. And you're sit, you're sitting, and and if you're in that fourth state, <clears throat> you're you're not uh, uh, you're 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 not attached to the fact that the sit feels good. You're not attached to the fact that it feels bad. Would that be nice? Would you like that? I mean, it's it's quite a, quite a, 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 a high level. Um. So the Buddha said at that point, at the four, and this is really repeated in many, many sutras. At that point, he uh, looked and he experienced all of his former uh, lives, all of his former incarnations, and and then this was the first uh, great insight. And then he experienced the uh, passing, rising, and passing of all beings in the past. If you did that, was the second. Uh, and then he experienced the end, the destruction of the taints. So in other words, one description of his uh, uh, journey is that at the fourth, at the fourth jhana, the fourth samadhi, he then, uh, maybe using uh, vision and knowledge, using wisdom, he, <clears throat> he um, really destroyed uh, well, ignorance is one of them, and um, the taint of uh, sensual desire and um, being, I think it's called in wisdom, I mean, and ignorance. But anyway, so, so that's one description of his path to enlightenment. The other description, which I want to talk about, because it's fascinating, is, the, and it's really interesting because that's, this is one thing that you'll read in the scripture, and the other is he names the other four jhanas. There's four more. Burn. Now, if those first four are a little bit problematic, the next four are extremely uh, problematic. And I want to talk about them because it's quite fascinating. And if you're not fascinated by it, you know what I say, don't you? To hell with you. So I said that at, when I, at, the, at the benefit. I, said, I was playing a song, you know, and I said, if you don't like this, to hell with you. And someone called me from Texas and said... Did you really mean that? <laughs> I'm going to have to quit being flippant. So the scriptures say that we live in, an, in the non-meditative world, 
in the world that we basically live in, let's just say before we come here and have a sip, and really in a way I mean that, we, most of us live in what's called the desire realm. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, that would be where we are more or less bombarded by and controlled by the hindrances. We're maybe bombarded by, controlled by greed and by aversion. by doubt. So, wouldn't you say that a lot of time that's the case, that that's the way that the world we live in, is the desire world. Mm -hmm. So when we sit and we, and the mind becomes concentrated, which is what we're talking about, when the mind experiences <coughs> some taste of samadhi, it's called we're, we, we're moving out of the desire realm into what's called the form realm. Or sometimes it's called the fine material form. And the form realm is those four jhanas, right? The first jhana is uh, replied thought, sustained thought, rapture, PT, and uh, concentration. The second one you drop those two third you drop uh, uh, rapture and then the fourth you do you drop any attachment to feeling good or feeling bad you let it go. so that's called the desire realm I mean the form realm Buddhism and this is to some extent unique to Buddhism it, to some extent I think as you go further with this it really is you really the only place you will find it in Hinduism is about a thousand years after the Buddha died when it sort of slowly came into it, what's called Advaita, but that's quite old. I mean, that's quite late in the game. But this is like maybe the most unique aspect of, uh, of, um, of any re uh, religious tradition that I know of. I think it is. I just thought of that, by the way. Because, that, because the Buddha says that, that he went out of that fourth jhana, that fourth samadhi, the attachment, I mean, the, the, the letting go of, the, of, of attachment to uh, pleasure or pain. I mean, that's pretty big, <laughs> right? That you can let go of uh, any attachment to pleasure or pain. But he said that the mind can go out of the form realm entirely. What does that mean? It means that you're sitting and the mind can move to a place where consciousness loses a sense of form. Does anyone ever, did you ever sit and start kind of losing a sense of the shape of your body? <laughs> right? You can almost lose the uh, the experience of, of, of the body being solid at all. You can, you can begin to feel like energy. That's the movement towards leaving form. So in, uh, the, the, in some ways there's a, one description, you know I said I was going to call this a climbing Mount Samadhi. There's one description of this where he says I surmounted this. I surmounted this. It's almost I, you know, so because what he says that he did and what many people have described over many years is that you can actually leave this state, uh, this form room, and come into a place where your object is called infinite space. That becomes your object of me meditation, infinite space. That's number five. Samadhi number five. Did you ever have experience of infinite ways? Maybe just a little bit. And this is, you know, this is like, um, this is where we start talking about the Buddhist concept of emptiness, right? When we start, we, we, we're talking about sunyata and what is emptiness. Well, if you're if you're sitting there and you are have have you have uh, the experience. Of uh, no longer an object in terms of you know the sense you have no sense of uh, your body or, um, or thoughts, 
and your object is infinite space, that, that would be um, the beginning of an experience of uh, emptiness. But there's something that is not empty in infinite space. What would that be? What would be not empty in <laughs> consciousness? I mean, there's something that is aware of infinite space, right? So you may not be sitting there, you know, thinking this and thinking that, and, or, or, and you may be well beyond you know, pleasure and pain, but you're still, there is something in there that is aware of infinite space. So then the skillful meditator might then say, oh, mm, mm, here's a problem. So in other words, so they're, now they're still clinging, and so then this, the next Jhana, jhana number six would be moving and becoming a meditating on consciousness itself. There's actually an ancient uh, um, discipline called consciousness only in China, and uh, this, uh, to some extent, is uh, I think perhaps where that comes from. But anyway, well, that's not really true. It comes from yoga kara. So infinite, uh, infinite consciousness would be the number five, number six. And, uh, and then uh, the Buddha supposedly moved out of number six into number seven, which is called nothingness. And no one, that one's kind of hard to describe, <laughs> but that would be where you have left even watching consciousness and there would be an experience of nothingness. That's an interesting one and I'm not gonna go on to, uh, with it because it's uh, some people, it is, uh, there are many, uh, there's some controversy about it. The, but then that's not all. Because the, the, the ultimate one, the last one, that the mind seems to be capable of holding is out, out of the, out, um, is moving. And again, this is all has to do with letting go. Every single one of these. From John number one, you let go of thinking and sustained thought, right? Number two, you let go of, um, of, of rapture. Number three, you let go of pleasure. Number four. So each one is letting go of something. So uh, letting go of the realm of nothingness because you still experience that there's something, some other place to go. And it's described as uh, neither perception nor non-perception. So it just simply uh, well, simply means it, it, it's it. If, if, if the realm, the first desire realm, and we have three realms, right? The desire realm, the form realm, and this is the immaterial. If the desire realm is where words are, you see the problem of talking about this, right? The realm of neither perception or non-perception, right? Because I'm using, right, the tools of the desire realm, words, and it is beyond description. It, it is certainly uh, where um, the mind is on, according to the Buddha, the mind is on the verge of nirvana at that place. It's, you know, I mean, in other words, it, it is uh, so, so far beyond uh, what we, in this, in this uh, mentality that we're sitting here now, it's like, so you hear Victor say, oh, so there's this place called the realm of neither perception nor non-perception. Well, that sounds, that sounds very strange. So in other words, it's only, uh, it only can be described, I, I would say, from the experience, from inside the experience. Um, so I'm almost finished. Okay, so I've described to you that there are eight, uh, you might say eight, uh, a set, uh, eight samadhis, right? The four form and the four formless, immaterial. And they are a process of the mind moving further and further and further and further uh, towards uh, complete uh, illumination. So there's one more thing to say. So, so the Buddhist, this is really, was rather startling to me when I first read it. He said that actually even in the realm of perception and non-perception, which is like we don't, even, we don't even know what the hell it is, right? I mean, even at that realm, the last realm, there can be a subtle clinging to it. Even there, there can be a subtle clinging in the realm of nothingness. There can be a subtle clinging in the realm of infinite consciousness, infinite space. Neither, in other words, 
that ego can cling in each one of those things. Clinging meaning it stays right there. That's, this is it, this is where I am. And so it's, it's, an, it's still a process of letting go, letting go. So the Buddha said, and I don't know if I, I'm gonna see if I can find this very fast. It's 106, 102. I bet I can't find it. Ooh. The way to the imperturbable, that may be it. Oh, God, I, excuse me, that's, that's the set of, The venerable Anand, on the side of the blessed one, venerable sir, here a bhikkhu is practicing thus. Uh, so we're talking about the realm of perception and non-perception. So the Ananda says to the Buddha, so does that mean he's, can, he's going to be hitting nir, uh, nirvana? And the Buddha said, one person might attain it from there and one person might not. I think Ananda's jaw probably dropped down, right? <laughs> I was like, what? I mean, if you're there, aren't, aren't you, can't you hit nirvana? And, and the Buddha said, here, Ananda, a bhikkhu is practicing this. It might not be, well, I'm going to skip that. He delights in that state. Even that final state, he delights in it. And he said, as he does so, his consciousness becomes dependent on it and he will cling to it. So he will not go into nirvana. And that's a state that, you know, like maybe four people have experienced in the past. <laughs> I'm joking. But really, I mean, we are talking about extraordinarily high state. And even at that level, and you certainly could talk about, you know, extraordinarily advanced meditators and holy people, even at that level, he says, if you delight in it, you will, you will, you will depend on it. So he says that when the, uh, he says that a bhikkhu is practicing, experiencing that, and he does not delight in it. He does not become dependent on it. He does not cling to it. And so therefore, and here's what he said. He moves out of that state to a state of non-perception and non-sensation, and that is his description. And that is that is description of entering nirvana. So, is this like a? Are you ready to just quit now? Meditating? <laughs> well, what the hell? What's... <laughs> it's quite extraordinary. I think that you... It's kind of clear why people don't really talk about it, isn't it? I mean, right? I mean, you don't read too much about it and people don't talk about it so much because, number one, it tends to be uh, almost beyond our conceptual able to conceptualize it, at least from, from this conceptualizing thinking mind. When he died, I'm going to read you uh, his, when he went into Paranirvana. Uh, it is said that the Blessed One entered the first jhana. Rising from the first jhana, he entered the second jhana. Rising from the second jhana, he entered the third jhana. Rising from the third jhana, he entered the fourth jhana. Rising out of the first jhana, fourth jhana, he entered the sphere of infinite space. Rising from the attainment of the sphere of infinite space, he entered the sphere of infinite consciousness. Rising from the attainment of the sphere of infinite consciousness, he entered the sphere of nothingness. Rising from the attainment of the sphere of nothingness, he entered the sphere of neither perception nor non. Rising out of the attainment of neither the sphere of neither perception or non-perception, he attained to the, the cessation of perception and feeling. That was it. I said it incorrectly. Perception of 
the cessation, the end of perception and feeling. Okay, so then Ananda spoke to uh, uh, Anuruddha and saying, the Blessed One has passed away. And Anuruddha said, no, friend. He hasn't passed away. He's entered the state of secession of perception and feeling. Then the Blessed One, rising out of the session of perception and feeling, entered the sphere of neither perception or non-perception, and then from there uh, to the sphere of nothingness, from there to the infinite consciousness, from there to the infinite space. Rising from the attainment of the sphere of infinite space, he entered the fourth jhana, then the, from there the third, from there the second, from the first, and then he went back up, second, third, fourth. Rising from the fourth jhana, the blessed one immediately passed away. Well, that was a lot of work, wasn't it? Just to die? <laughs> But so this is what he did, right? So in other words, he went through, he, he experienced everything that he had attained in meditation, right? Just before, before he was ready to pass away, he experienced each of those eight, attained each of those eight, then, then he went to, the, to neither perception nor feeling, and then he came back down, and then he went up and left out of the fort. So uh, I share this with you because, and, and I had a resistance to doing this. I mean, most, most of you who sit with me know that this is, not in, <laughs> I have, this is not something I usually do. I have a resistance to it only because it does seem so extremely far away from what anyone even aspires to do. How many, is really, how many of you are, are interested in neither perception or non-perception? Raise your hand. <laughs> well, okay, so but see, he doesn't even know what his name is. He sometimes thinks his name is Jeff, no sometimes he thinks it's Bryant, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, but let's see how to say this. I, I, I'm going, I'm trying to uh, make lemonade out of lemons here. Um, I do think that it is true that we do not uh, focus on enough and concentrate, talk enough about uh, samadhi and, and about the, the, the capacity of the mind to go into an extraordinary state of one-pointedness. And uh, whether you uh, as aspire to, uh, uh, whether you aspire to, to go all the way up to uh, beyond number eight or not, it, it, there's no question there is absolutely no question. He says this over and over and over. It's astonishing, right? He repeats this over and over and over. You do not read nearly as much mindfulness in the in the Pali. I mean, there are many many uh, thoughts that the the mindfulness is a, came later, in, much later in the uh, forty five years that he taught. I don't know that that's true or not true, but. But it is absolutely clear that his experience came from meditation. You know, as, as I said yesterday in the beginner's class, he didn't read any of this, right? He didn't have a, a book of scriptures. He, you know, he, it comes from his experience. And he says that experience was, is from extraordinary concentration. So, um, I don't think that it's uh, harmful for you to aspire to uh, hit the first jhana. Right. What do you think? Okay, so uh, uh, that's it.